personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library Podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. Now, we all know Barack Obama never had a scandal because the media never said he had a scandal. (laughs) But what if he did? What if he did have a scandal? I've got my man Sam Jacobs here to tell us more. Well, let's just pretend that uh, the Obama Justice Department under Eric Holder uh, let criminals buy guns that they knew about, did nothing about it, and those guns uh, ended up in the hands of terrorists who killed a bunch of people at the Eagles of Death Metal concert in France that you may have heard about. That's not scandalous because Barack Obama did it. You know, can the guy do any wrong? I don't know. No. The jury's still out. Perfect in every way. Smells like strawberries, peace ginger beer. We, we we had the whistleblower for this on. He was actually our first outside guest. He was a guy named Vince, Vincent Sheffaloo. Um, He was really nice and cool and had a lot of interesting things to say about this. You guys should go back and, and check it out. Um, the thing that like stuck with me about it was that what incensed him kind of the most about it was, you know, I, I we're not big fans of the ATF on this podcast. I think it's, probably pretty obvious that that's the case not great ones, um, no vincent was vincent was a great guest regardless and um he basically feels that you know the the atf could be a like valuable organization and actually makes a like pretty compelling argument for it if you listen to it you know it's like the people who want to get rid of the atf it's like okay well guess what the fbi is now now doing what the atf does do you want the Do you want the FBI doing it? Well, probably not. Um, so I would urge people to give that a listen when you're done with this. Um, I'm pretty proud of how that came out. But you know, let's. I don't even know where. Like, it's like I don't even know where to start with how crazy this is. Because like, this is one of those things. You ever know notice that there's like a certain type of scandal? Um, the Hillary Clinton Podesta emails are like a good example of it where Mm. it's like 100 percent true but sounds so insane to anyone who's never heard of it because it's like come on this would be on the news right the 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 obama justice department is uh letting criminals buy guns and and uh one of those guns got a you know it was the weapon that a border patrol agent was killed with but come on that would have been on the news uh no so United States Border Patrol agent uh, Brian Terry was killed. Um, I am not a like goofy thank you for your service guy, but I always try and be nice to Border Patrol agents because like not only do I think that what they do is necessary and valuable, I think that they're like you know them and ICE agents are like on 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 every um, half wit leftists you know naughty list, and I uh, yeah I've bought coffee for like. Border Patrol agents, if I see them in a in a gas station mm-hmm. or something, um, without Canada's Border Patrol, I I might still be dating my ex girlfriend. You know, they still like. I mean, that yeah, really. Uh, yeah, she kind she kind of got deported when we were going into Canada, but th- I think that's another podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so on December fourteenth, twenty ten, that's when Brian Terry was murdered. There were also over 150 crime scenes where Mexican citizens were either killed or maimed, uh, and some of the guns that they allowed to land in the hands of criminals uh, were used in the November 2015 terrorist attack at the Bataclan. You know, it was officially known as as Project Gunrunner. Um, You may know it as Operation Fast and Furious, which it was called... Uh, because some of these guys that were doing it were in a car club together. Um, 
you know, and I love it's little little known Sam Jacobs fact. I love the Fast and the Furious movies. I think they I think each one is better than the last. Um, huh. Yeah, I'm a big Vin Diesel fan. What can I say? So I like I liked his uh, what's the one where he's a spaceman who could see in the dark. Oh, Riddick. Those are cool. I haven't seen yeah, the car movies. Um, Operation Fast and Furious started under George W. Bush, which I think is like we, you know, when this scandal broke, um, I think that we were still in that weird period of madness where people felt that they had to show some respect and deference toward the accursed Bush family. Uh, and I am very much glad that America has been broken out of that hypnotic spell. So this was going on under Bush, but it was significantly um, more in, in more prevalent under President Obama. You know, there's I mean, there's tons of like there's tons of scandals with the Obama administration and would that they got the attention that Russia spending ten thousand um, dollars on ads telling you not to masturbate and that children are being sex trafficked in a pizza shop got during the last four years, but this is the world we live in. Um, so basically there were guns that were like the ATF was running guns uh, and they, these guns were allowed to kill uh, hundreds of people. And there was a eventual uh, congressional investigation where Eric Holder the attorney general, what a piece of work that guy was. I mean, like you should read about Eric Holder. Eric Holder is like about a, about a 10th of the qualifications of Barack Obama and about 10 times as much as the, uh, racial resentment of Barack Obama, which is saying a lot about both of those things. First sitting cabinet member in American history to be held in criminal contempt of Congress. That is a big deal. Um, So, you know, obviously nobody here is under the illusion that the controlled press in this country is any kind of a fair or impartial source of information. Um, We don't have journalists anymore. We have public relations officials uh, for the Democratic Party for institutional neoliberalism, for non-governmental organizations, m- many of which receive significant sums from George Soros. Um, if we had a free press in this country, if we had any actual journalists left uh, in legacy media, they would have been all over this. But I actually think that like people doing actual journalism um, are really I, I i admire their bravery i admire their intelligence um i admire their you know tenacity and going after a story um i think that that journalists are actually good uh, i just don't think that anybody who works in 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 the you know legacy media is a journalist anymore well these msm propagandists who get all huffy when we don't revere them for 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 what they do they're, they're pretty much the same as guys who wear army t-shirts and ask to be saluted when they never actually served. Yeah. I mean, right. They're not even, that's the thing. They're not even journalists. You know, they're not no. like, I get, I get they're like, people resent propagandists. The yeah, it's just proper. It's just propaganda and PR. Um, I'll tell you who is a journalist though. Uh, David Caudria of the war on guns and Mike Vanderboo, who sadly has passed away. Um, he, ran a website called the uh, Sipsy Street Irregulars and has been denounced both by Bill Clinton and the Southern Poverty Law Center. So, hell of a guy in my book, knowing even if I knew only that data point about him, um, we would know nothing about any of this if it weren't for these two guys who are actual journalists. And I think that that is a good thing. Um, ATF agents at a website called Clean Up ATF were looking for a way to secure protection for their whistleblowers. And it was these two gentlemen who put them in touch with Senator Grassley, Cheryl Atkinson, and William LaGenus. 
were two exceptions to this, but mostly uh, it was either ignored or miscategorized as a botched sting operation. And this was not satisfactory to either Caudry or Vanderbrew, who really dug deep on this and really went through it. So let's talk about the scandal itself, which is like, it's so nuts and it's so Byzantine and it's so difficult to sift through and it's difficult to know when to start. So Project Gunrunner was a project of the ATF. It was designed to intercept weapons bound for organized crime in Mexico. Uh, The ATF, who, you know, are the same people who shot 14-year-old Sammy Weaver in the back, which should be mentioned like every time that the ATF ever comes up, that they shot a 14-year-old boy in the back. They, in their infinite wisdom, decided that it was a good idea to let illegally purchased guns walk, meaning don't arrest them, don't prosecute them. Um, And that way the federal government can keep an eye on them, arresting people for much serious crimes later. That was the idea. Uh, The execution was a little different, as we see. Starting in 2006, the Phoenix office of ATF not only allowed, but facilitated and encouraged what are known as straw purchases of firearms to known weapons traffickers. Uh, Straw purchase is when, you know, you come to me and you go, hey, Sam, I'm not legally allowed to buy a gun. And I go, don't worry about it, buddy. I'll go buy you a gun and give it to you. Um, And it's super illegal. You know, you or I would be thrown away too sweet if we were doing straw purchases. But, you know, if you're connected to uh, organized crime, we're just going to let it walk so that we can fry a bigger fish. Um, I so it's, it's kind of like when you're when you when you when you're 19 and you get a loser to buy you beer, but with guns. That's pretty much it. Yeah, um, yeah. That's that that's ba- that's basically it. So the the you know the gun owners of America believe, which is a good organization, they believe that uh, this was an attempt to boost statistics for the ATF and secure more funding. You know the. The um, the ATF is like, I think, been on a budget freeze for years now, which is basically a, a, a budget cut. But, you know, it's the government and no one wants to get rid of anything ever. Hmm. So there were legitimate gun dealers who did not like being involved in it. Uh, there were other you know ATF agents who didn't like being involved in it. Vincent Sheffaloo being a prime example of it. Uh, but they were generally strong armed into working with these and these were in opposition to long established ATF uh, standard operating procedures. So what eventually became operation fast and furious was only one operation underneath the auspices of project Gunrunner. Another was uh, operation wide receiver, which ran from 2006 to 2007 on George W Bush, Bush 43 uh, that was on his watch, and this was when they let a, uh, a licensed firearms dealer notify the ATF of a sp- suspicious purchase and was hired as a confidential informant. Good work if you can get it. And the ATF started monitoring straw purchases that were being made. Um, the dealer sold 450 weapons, including AR-15s, uh, AKs, uh, Colt 38s. And most of these were lost after they moved south of the border. 64 of these 450 weapons were seized before they crossed into Mexico. And the attorneys, the U.S. attorney's office didn't want to prosecute any of them because there was like no evidence, nothing really, nothing, nothing you could use in court, you know. And so the Justice Department under uh, George W. Bush declined to prosecute any of these cases. The Obama administration started prosecuting them in 2010. Nine overall were prosecuted. How shocked are you going to be to hear that I tell you that they that they that they hit them all with process crime charges? Um, and for those of you who don't know, process crimes are like the made up crimes that they slam you with when you haven't committed an actual crime, like uh, say 
Roger Stone lying to investigators. Uh, that's in giant air quotes. Well, you know, uh, we're not prosecuting you for anything, but we don't really like your story. So we're going to prosecute you for that. Uh, this is why you say absolutely nothing to these people without a lawyer present, like nothing. So, yeah, these guys were I, who knows if they were guilty or not of what they were actually, you know, originally investigated for. But they got them all. They they went for they went for nine of them on process crimes. One case was dropped. Five defendants pled guilty. One was sentenced and two were two were fugitives. So they got, you know, a little over half of them. They um, sorry, two thirds of them were were, um, you know, I don't know if they saw jail time, but anyway, they were convicted. Um, so that's, you know, six guys. Good job. Good job. ATF operation fast and furious was only one of these operations. Again, the name is because these guys had like a car club or they used to go racing or something together. Um, and operation fast and furious basically just picked up where the earlier gun walking practices, uh, left off as if it was this totally original thing. Firearms dealer contacted the ATF about a suspicious purchase. And these purchases, unlike Operation Wide Receiver, were like people were buying arsenals. I mean, these were hundreds, hundreds of weapons. Uh, there was no official collaboration between the firearms dealers and the ATF. And nobody bothered to tell anybody either. <laughs> this is what's crazy to me. Nobody bothered to tell anybody in working for Mexican law enforcement and nobody bothered to tell anybody at the Mexico city office of the ATF. I'm always a little sketchy on why there's a Mexico city office of the ATF, but there you are. So no, it seems like something the Mexican government might've liked to know. Yeah. And could have like helped with, but also I can see the, I can see the concern that like Latin American law enforcement, not, not yeah, known for being that. on the up and up. Um, yeah. You know, I okay. was, I would, I was thinking about relocating to Argentina some years back. Uh, and a friend of mine who's par, uh, par, sorry, Uruguayan. He was like, uh, you know, I was looking into visa stuff and I said, well, what, how am I going to get a visa? And he's like, bro, you just like cross the border into, into Uruguay, Uruguay, you know, twice a year. And, and it's, they just keep counting you as a tourist every time you do it. And I was like, really? And he was like, well, let me put it this way. If they don't, it's Latin America money talks. And I was like, wait, mm. really? I can, I can do that. And he's like, do it all the time. Crazy to me. But that's just, I, I honestly, in some ways think it's better than what we do here. Cause I, I like the idea of like, you know, if, if you just want to shake me down, then just shake me down. You know, like, we don't let's not dance about it. Let's just just shake me down and tell me what your price is. We get it over with. And um, I think there's something to be said for for that kind for that style of corruption yeah. as opposed to well, our. We cor- don't have to wait at a counter. I mean, it's like our style of corruption is what we're seeing here is like these these uh, these guys who like are not terribly comp- competent, believe completely in what they're doing. And like their scruples are all about enforcing you know all about it's like we have lawful evil government in the united states for those of you who have ever played uh tabletop rpg games you know the alignment of our government is 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 a uh, lawful evil it's like the letter of the law is very important and and <laughs> is used to do evil um and you know i guess that like latin american government is like chaotic good where you can get away with pretty much anything <laughs> just like grease the right grease the right gears and you got possibly more freedom than we have in this country um in some ways but we digress so you know these were huge purchases unlike what they were dealing with previously no one in mexico either working for the united states government or the mexican government had the slightest clue what was going on um atf got additional funding and reorganized as a strike force that included members of ATF, FBI, DEA, and ICE that was run through the U S attorney's office rather than the jurisdiction of alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and weapons dealers again, were like, 
we keep seeing the same guys coming in all the time over a course of a couple months. They're buying the same weapons. That's weird because it's not the like, it's not what do you need 15 AR 15s for kind of thing. It's like, no, this dude just like comes in every month and buys 200 AR 15s, you know, or whatever, whatever it was like, that's like, you know, no, no one, no one who's like, intending to use guns for lawful purposes is buying like 200 AR-15s a month or whatever. I'm sorry if if you ref- if you use a magazine once and then throw the rifle away. Yeah, I mean I'm sorry if there's some guy like Scrooge McDuck swimming around in his vault full of AR-15s that I that I have mischaracterized and I apologize for that and I'm by yeah, no we don't means want to annoy that guy. Yeah, by no means am I saying like you shouldn't be allowed to buy 200 AR 15s a month. If your budget allows for it, I'm just saying, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone doing that's, you know, buying, buying AR 15s. Cause they're following the law. Um, again, if you're, you know, backstroking in your, your Scrooge McDuck pool full of guns. Um, yeah. First of all, awesome dude. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, that, we should tell them where you can buy ammo. <laughs> Ammo.com forward slash podcast, where you can get $20 off any order of $200 or more. And we apologize for offending you with our characterization that you might not be entirely on the up and up. But again, you are a huge outlier if that's you. So they were concerned. They were like, I mean, and I think that from the perspective of the gun dealers, it makes sense, right? Like, I don't think gun dealers want guys like running around with a bunch of guns that are going to, that are going to, um, you know, that are going to be used in criminal activity for a variety of reasons. One of which is that, you know, gun owners, legal gun owners tend to be very law abiding people. Um, another is like, you know, just from a, just from like a business perspective, like it's bad for business. Uh, uh, it's, Mm -hmm. you know, cause it's like somebody goes out and, does whatever they're going to do with, you know, 200 ARs, uh, every, per month. And, uh, you know, you may not, ha- you may not be a gun dealer or then there may not be any gun dealers period for much longer. So, yeah. So the, the, you know, the ATF usually just arrest the straw buyer members of the larger criminal organization at the point of transfer, confiscate the weapons in the process. They did not do that this time. They just let it fly. Um, or walk, I guess. And the top brass at the ATF prevented agents on the ground from following standard operating procedures. By June 2010, the suspects that they were surveilling under Operation Fast and Furious had purchased 1,600 weapons at a total of $1 million. Um, I don't know how many people were buying them, but that's a lot of, it's a lot of weapons. A um, lot of heavy hardware, and the ATF at this point in June 2010, five years before the Bataclan, and not long before the oh no, it would have been yeah, it was the day that they the day that um, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was murdered. Um, where was I? Um, oh yes, so I totally I'm so glad we have an editor. Um, <laughs> Editor, keep this in. Yeah, right. Exactly. Let everyone know what an idiot I am. So this is like six months before um, they knew there was, you know, 1,600 weapons uh, outstanding. Uh, they knew that 300 of these were had been found at crime scenes with 179 in Mexico and 130 in the United States. Uh, they were facilitating gun trafficking that resulted in violent crimes on American soil and abroad. So good job, guys. You're doing just great. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry murdered on December 14th, 2010, along with other members of the United States Border Patrol. No, sorry. He was not murdered along with them. That's that's a mistake. Um, He was, you know, patrolling 11 miles from the Mexican border. They came across five selected illegals, fired beanbags, and were responded to with live ammunition. Um, And during the firefight, he was killed. Four of the suspects were arrested. Two AKs were found nearby, traced back to Operation Fast and Furious within hours. The bullet that killed him was damaged beyond the ability to link it to the operation. 
acting deputy attorney general and deputy chief of staff were both notified. Uh, but, you know, it's just a Border Patrol agent, so who cares? So why bother contacting the attorney general? Um, this is what they think of you, by the way, Border Patrol agents and combat soldiers in the combat um, troops in the military and, you know, cops and p- take your pick. Uh, this is how much they value your life when you're murdered by gangsters in the desert. So ATF agent John Dodson contacted uh, Senator Chuck Grassley, who was at the time the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and he was instrumental in actually getting this investigated. Uh, this was the end of Operation Fast and Furious, which isn't that much of a surprise. 2,000 weapons purchased by straw buyers that the ATF just let walk. 389 were recovered in the United States. 276 were uh, found in Mexico. That means that there are over 1,000 that remain on the streets. Um, and at le- in at least one case, uh, ATF agent John Dodson was directly involved in the transfer of weapons to a known weapons trafficker. This is also the thing where it's like, you know, I, I think that most law abiding governor gun owners really did the idea of uh, organized criminal gangs having these kinds of weapons really doesn't sit right with them. And this is, you know, like, God, this is what the ATF is doing. This is what they're doing with your tax dollars. So where'd they all go? Well, they keep turning up at crime scenes. <laughs> big, big shock. Um, Eric Holder. To this day. <laughs> yeah, like what a what a what a what a stunning turn of events. These these guns that we're letting uh, mobsters buy are turning up at uh, are turning up at crime scenes. Who could have predicted such a thing? <laughs> Eric Holder says that he. I, this is one of these things too. That's like these people are just so arrogant. I just. Eric Holder has stated on the record that he believes the weapons will continue to turn up for years to come. And Hey, like it's just like a hurricane coming or something, right? Nothing could, nothing could have been done to prevent this from happening. Certainly not. Um, these weapons were used in several high profile crimes in Mexico. There was a 50 Cal used against a Mexican police helicopter. I mean, I'm like laughing because it's like it doesn't sound real, but it is. It's very, very real. Um, I think a 50 cal. Yeah. Like like a rifle or a pistol. um, I'm going to guess that the 50 cal was like turret mounted in some degree because that's a serious round. And if you're taking out a police helicopter with it. um, Yeah, I'm guessing that's that's some kind of turret mount that one. The, you know, I don't know, man, maybe they were shooting at a shooting at a police helicopter with a desert eagle, but I kind of doubt it. That's Um, some Terminator stuff. That would be. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, that that uh, that would be um, awesome if anyone It totally wouldn't be. But you guys like, yeah, it's of course, that's not what they did. But it's yeah, it was probably it was probably a rifle of some kind. Um Mexican beauty queen was murdered. I mean, I think that we're like, I think that we're rightly outraged uh, that we're rightly more outraged by the fact that Americans were killed with this, because I think that people kind of have a natural affinity for their countrymen. And I think that that's, that's fine. And you know, it's well and good. And it doesn't mean that you don't value the lives of Mexican citizens as well. Um, But I, I think obviously, you know, it's more of an outrage when it's an American. Um, and I think that's a totally understandable response, but let's not leave out, you know, how many Mexicans do you think were killed by these weapons? Um, the, probably the biggest crime they were used in again was the, I don't think it was just at the Bataclan. I think that these weapons were used throughout the Islamist attacks in Paris in 2015. Cause there was a whole series of coordinated attacks um, the ATF actually trafficked weapons used in the attack to a Phoenix dealership that was associated 
with Operation Fast and Furious. Um, so, and you know, like I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of the band Eagles of Death Metal. Like I, I don't hate them; they're fine, but I'm, just, I'm not, I'm not a fan. But um, that dude in the band with the mustache and the hair, it, people who know this guy are gonna know who I'm talking about. But I should, I'll just look up his name. Uh, do you know his name? I'm not familiar with this band. I only know about them because of what happened. I think they're like a, I think, I think they're, yeah, they're, I think they're a, um, I think they're a Queens of the Stone Age side project. Um, hmm. Jesse Hughes. No, I only listen to Hall of Dogs. Jesse Hughes rules. And if you have Instagram, um, you should go follow him on Instagram. Cause man, son is woke. I mean, like he his, his his videos are like him walking around the grocery store with no mask, and him talking about how Biden's coming for your guns, and like um, Jesse Hughes is great. Like I don't, I'm not, I'm not really into Eagles of Death Metal. It's not really my thing. Um, I like Queens of Stone Age fine, but I'm just not into Eagles of Death Metal. But Jesse Hughes is like, whew. and it's also funny because it was like he he wasn't. As far as I know, he was not like, I, I don't know that it, it's that he wasn't like conservative or even if he defines himself as conservative now. Um, but I, I recall him being just like not super political before this. And then he was kind of like, you know, did some did some like really tepid, like what the hell man kind of response to people getting, you know, murdered and genitally mutilated at one of his concerts and of course you know it wasn't like the the, the response any any response other than won't someone think of the poor muslims after there's a an islamic terrorist attack uh is is like prima facie evidence that you're evil racist fascist blah 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 um and i think that and he kind of got like canceled for it and he gave this kind of half-hearted apology and then he disappeared for a while and then he came back and he was like he was just like man this is barack obama's fault and now he's an anti-masker and he's cool you should you know i'm sure that if you go on youtube you can find some cool videos of uh of jesse hughes talking about this but um i mean the short answer is like we're never going to know how many American citizens are dead because of what the ATF did or just, you know, people in general are dead. There's no way we'll ever know. I would, I would guess it's in the hundreds. Um, cause I bet these weapons saw a lot of use down in Mexico and I'm sure, you know, a bunch of them probably filtered down to Honduras, which is, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, has the highest murder rate of any country in the world. So yeah, I'm guessing you know, these aren't, um, sitting in a vault. They're getting a lot of use. <laughs> Representative Daryl Issa, Issa, don't know how to say it, uh, of California, who is the chairman of the house committee on oversight and government reform and Senator Grassley, who again is the ranking member of the Senate judiciary committee. Uh, they led an investigation, which was mostly, uh, happened because of ATF whistleblowers. So this was mostly, it was like ATF whistleblowers who um, were responsible for the, for this getting done. And Eric Holder claimed he didn't know anything about it. I mean, a number of people disagree. I, I don't know. I mean, know about it is a kind of vague term. It's like, do I believe that he had absolutely no knowledge of it? Not really. Um, do I think that he had any kind of like intimate knowledge about how business was conducted at the El Paso office of ATF? Um, I very much doubt that as well. I'm sure he knew something though. Um, ATF agent Vince Sheffaloo was fired in June, 2011, mostly for, uh, pro probably for, you know, exposing this. He was the main whistleblower. He testified before Congress that purchases of, AKs and 50 cals were happening daily. 50 cals getting purchased daily is something else. Nothing was done. And he said, I cannot begin to think of how the risk of letting guns fall into the hands of known criminals could possibly advance any legitimate law enforcement interests. Um, you know, I think that like 
the whole you know cop show trope of like you look the other way on the guy selling dime bags so that you can bust the bust the real criminals Mm -hmm. um i think that's like a real thing and they probably do that and it's probably good that they do but i just don't see how like yeah letting guys buy ak's and 50 cals on the daily uh is gonna you know what what they thought the end game there was i think that thought is probably uh i think that word's doing a lot of work in that sentence you know there's kind of this like the atf kind of has a reputation for like well, I couldn't 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 get into the FBI and I couldn't get into the DEA, so I don't know. I get, you know couldn't get into the Secret Service, couldn't get into the marshals, um, ATF. <laughs> you know, that's it. Kind of has the reputation, true or not, of being you know the place where you go when no other alphabet agency is going to take you. And so I, you know, I I think that, and I think that this is like. You know, this is such a Keystone Cops thing. I mean, it's just so stupid because it's like it's not it's not, you know, dime bags of weed. It's like 50 cals. Uh, and we're and P.S. We're like we're letting organized we're letting mobsters buy them. You know, I just I I I I I um I struggle to understand kind of what the reasoning was. I think what the reasoning was is the ATF is like full of you know, 85 IQs is basically what I think is going on here. A number of people who are in charge of the operation, boy, if this isn't government in action, promoted, promoted, transferred to Washington, uh, U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona, Dennis K. Burke, admitted to leaking sensitive documents about uh, Dodson, who was another whistleblower to the public, Grassley believes that Burke was trying to protect people higher up in the Justice Department. Um, obviously, that's not a thing that we'll ever probably know. It is uh, something you typically get promoted for doing, at least. I don't think he got promoted, though. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think that he specifically got promoted, though. Um, Democrats on House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, laid blame on that was their line was it was the phoenix office and you know nobody in atf or the justice department is to blame um eric holder again a uh, real piece of work that guy is he probably almost certainly withheld out uh, withheld evidence concealed ev- evidence held back documents continued to deny any any knowledge uh was threatened with contempt of congress strong-armed into appearing for his seventh time um the congressional report on holder described his view of the murder of agent terry as a nuisance which god does that not surprise me that he's just like why do i even have to deal with the death of this peasant um eric holder is such a piece of garbage such a piece of garbage i i like you know there's there's people i don't like you know like I, I like I don't like the Bush family. I don't like the politicians they throw up. Um, I I really don't like Barack Obama, but like I just have complete contempt for Eric Holder. I mean, everything I've ever heard about the guy uh, is is just like he's just such a piece of garbage. Um, the report further stated that Holder knew about gun walking in general. And Operation Fast and Furious specifically. He even knew, according to the report, the congressional report, he knew that the weapons involved in the shootout resulted in the death of Agent Terry as far back as 2010. Um, this is way before you know any investigation happened. Um, they accused Holder of stonewalling Grassley's investigation which doesn't surprise me because it's, you know, the number, the number one uh, rule of government employment is CYA. And that is what he is doing. So on June 20th, 2012, the house oversight and government reform committee voted to recommend holding holder in contempt. Um, He was refusing to hand over 1300 pages of documents to Congress um, earlier that day and at the request of Eric Holder, who was like, you know, 
You ever you ever you ever wonder why uh, Rob Schneider is in like every uh, Adam Sandler movie? Of course you haven't, because you're yes. not a weirdo like me. No, no, I think they're great friends. And, they're, yeah, uh, it's he just it's the same deal with uh, John Cusack and who's that guy? Uh, I don't know, I don't remember his name. Uh, Jeremy Piven is like they're buddies. So anytime one of them gets a gets a role, the other one gets a role. Um, Holder's basically there because he's you know. Obama's little toady. And for the first time during his administration, Barack Obama invoked executive privilege over these documents. Uh, again, June 28th, 2012, Eric Holder, first sitting member of the cabinet of the United States to be held in criminal, criminal, criminal contempt of Congress. The House voted 255 to 67 for this. This was not some party line split and the Republicans had a five seat majority and they, and they rammed it through. Okay. Cause I'm sure that the, you know, if you're ha- talking with one of your buddies after work, who thinks Barack Obama was like, you know, whatever Barack Obama people think he is. And Eric Holder is just peaches and cream. Um, this was 255 to 67. This was not a close vote. So yeah, they, they did this for his refusal to disclose internal Justice Department documents in response to a congressional subpoena. They also voted on a civil contempt measure, which was went slightly better in Holder's favor. That one was 258 to 95. Oh, that's much nicer for him. Um, That means that they can take him to court uh, for the executive privilege claim and the Justice Department Inspector General found that the Dallas office, the ATF, could have arrested some of the men involved in the uh, death of ICE officer Jamie Zapata, but did not act. The civil case was eventually settled in 2019. The Justice Department agreed to release more documents. The ATF's budget, uh, I guess, was frozen in 2016. I don't know if, uh, you know, whoever's pulling the puppet strings over at the Oval Office right now is going to do anything about that. I wouldn't be surprised if they, if the Biden regime were the ones to start giving ATF money again, um, does not have a Senate approved director. And um, basically the thought is that under the Trump administration, that he was basically attempting to choke it into an early and, and welcome death. This is pretty much the worst thing that they've done since they shot 14-year-old Sammy Weaver in his back uh, while trying to execute a warrant for a guy they were entrapping. But, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing I want to leave it on, you know, like I... (laughs) my if it's rare like i'm pretty i'm a pretty cynical person and and it's rare that i get like this worked up about something but the atf is just like it's the mad dog agency of the federal government i mean there's all kinds of federal alphabet agencies and we may not necessarily like what they do and we may not even think that they have you know that they in a perfect world we would want them to exist But like, you know, the DEA grabs guys who are like going to import fentanyl into the United States. And like, I am glad they do. Uh, The FBI has people whose only job is to profile and catch serial killers. I think those guys are like probably insanely smart. And again, I'm like, glad some glad someone's out there doing that. Um, I don't, I've never heard of the ATF doing something where I'm like, man, I'm sure glad, sure glad the ATF is out there keeping us all safe. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think that with respect to Vincent Sheffaloo that, um, yeah, they should be broken up and split up and, you know, um, Homeland security can take the explosives section and, uh, DEA can take the alcohol and tobacco and, uh, the FBI can take the firearms and, I, I I just I've never heard of the FBI do, or the ATF rather doing anything that I'm like cool I'm glad, awesome good good job guys it's always something like this you know it's always like oh we shot a kid in the back and we you know let a bunch of let a bunch of mobsters buy fifty cals and they murdered people with them and like 
Um, you know, they're not sending their best. It sure don't look like. But the question I want to leave in everybody's mind is, what are they doing right now that we don't know about? Hmm. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's somebody assigned to this podcast. Uh, probably like God, not that I, not that I think we're much of a priority, but, uh, I just think that the, that the like surveillance state has expanded so dramatically that like, you know, somebody in, uh, uh, Quantico or whatever is like what if what if all our listeners were government agents uh well i would tell them that they should buy ammo at ammo.com forward slash podcast where you can get twenty dollars off two hundred dollars any purchase of two hundred dollars or more um you don't have to tell you know accounts payable that you got that discount you can just pocket that 20 bucks my brother um you can get uh, I don't know what they use. I mostly, you know, would guess be from like what Crockett has on Miami Vice is like my. So you guys have 38 specials. Uh, we got we got that. We got 44 Magnums. We got 357 mags. Nine millimeter, 10 millimeter, 223, 12 gauge, 20 gauge. Uh, weird stuff. You know, we got weird stuff. Um, yeah, if we, we have nine millimeter flow bear in stock, what <laughs> honest to God, I mean, I feel like currently, I maybe not when this publishes, but nine millimeter flow bear to protect yourself against very large insects. Yeah. I feel like I had, like I, like I bought a box of that by accident once. I feel like more people buy nine millimeter flow bear <laughs> by accident <laughs> than, than anything. It's just one of those. Well, we got it, gang. Uh, Ammo.com forward slash podcast. That's where you get $20 off any order of $200 or more. Again, I am Sam Jacobs. This is the Resistance Library Podcast brought to you by Ammo.com. For Dave Trello, we will see you next time.